Did I you know, did oh. you make that other one out of just two pieces? Yeah. We're live. Hi, fo- where? Which camera? Where Sec- we here? Second one, yep. Hi, folks. Welcome to our uh, Saturday Night Live. I was going to say pardon the mess, but don't pardon the mess. I've been working on benches all day, which is what our topic is tonight. How many people do we have on, Frick? Uh, 181 to start. 181 to start. So I'll do most of the introduction as we grow a little bit, so I don't have to repeat myself. As Frank Byrne says, I don't like chewing my cabbage twice. Frick, question? Uh, sure. First question comes from Sam Jones in Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. Hey, Sam. It says, what are the dimensions of your sharpening station, and how is it attached? Well, here. I'll show you. Now, this one is made to fit the bench. So it's 16 inches wide, which is essentially the width of the base. It sticks out 12 inches. It's uh, glued and screwed to a block of hardwood. And hardwood, just because the thing is cantilevered, so you want it to be fairly robust. Are you on your camera now, Jake? Mm -hmm. Yep. So that piece is the same length, 16 inches. It is three inches wide by inch and 13 sixteenths thick. So this is glued and screwed. You want to use type on three because it's waterproof. There's a one degree slope on here, just enough so that the slurry runs this way and not that way, bad enough that it gets on there anyway. And then we just, if it's your bench, then I just once you get your height, it's just bolted. There's a bolt runs all the way through, one here and one over there. And it works great. Rounded the corners just so that you, when you're walking around it, you don't end up getting that corner in the knee. And we made it out of, what is that? that well, it was three-quarter pressure treated. Oh, it was three-quarter pressure treated, and I think they ran it through the <coughs> planter just to clean it up a little bit. And in case you're wondering, the height on this one is 25 inches. And that's a little bit high for me, but, I mean, it works. Really a, a very uh, individual thing the dimension next uh, lots of questions tonight 40 but luther hasn't filtered them yet i don't know where he is so okay where is he luther this one comes from david in victoria hey david he says i'm planning to build a cosmic bench with a schoberg vice as per the plans i also have a vintage Richardson Wilcox vice that I'd like to add as a face vice. Does this, is this a reasonable plan? Well, I don't know what the Richardson vice looks like, but you can do anything you want. All you have to do is uh, when we, we have in the past had a vice on that end, like it is, and a vice on the That's opposite the end. Well, for a right hand, it would be over here. We would mount it right here. All you have to do is cut the profile of the... Now, if it's a Schoberg, it's easy because I think the profile is only the, is an inch deep, maybe a little more. And you just cut that out of, out, of your, stretcher. out of your stretcher and it mounts back to about here. But um, you can modify anything, right? And if you had to, you could even... You could eliminate this stretcher if you had to. You still have three. Or you could take this stretcher and you could move, you could turn it sideways and put it up in here. So instead of being right here, you could put it back here. Or you could actually just add it to this one. So this one is laying like that and then add another one in like that just to strengthen it. Strengthen that one a little extra since you've removed that one. If <coughs> Wouldn't it be better to put the two of them side by side Double in them the up? center? Right in the middle. No, because I'm because you, you probably have to come over here a fair oh. distance in order to mount that. Next, Frick. Uh, next one comes from. Um, 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 um. I'll tell you. Um, I'll tell you what I'm doing. We're we're going to start selling. We are going to start selling Cosman workbenches. We're going to offer two. We're going to offer one with an MDF top. And we're going to offer one with Baltic birch top. Three pieces of one inch Baltic birch. So that's what I've been working on this week. 
the trestles are behind Jake and the stretchers are right here. I'm just setting up the drill press to drill them because for the ones that we're going to sell, and you might want to do this too, we're going to use, um, oh, what are these called, bid, bid real bolts, I think, something like that. <laughs> so obviously that will screw into a 5 16 diameter hole in the end of this, and then it'll just be one hole with a nut and a washer out on the face. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this hole a little larger diameter. Reason is you want to be able to bring it up so it's right at the top of the trestle. And the bottom one will be the exact diameter. So when, the, when you put the two bottom rails to, in, that will fit in a hole that there's no slop. The top one, the hole will be oversized. So as you tighten it up, if you need to tap it up a little bit to get it flush. The reason I tell you that is because even though we're trying to jig everything up carefully, by the time you actually make them and drill the holes, they're not always going to be everyone's exactly the same. That'll Uh, next one comes from Aaron in the chat. He says, what natural woods you re would you recommend for a traditional style bench? How hard should the wood be? Is something like silver maple hard enough? Uh, silver maple, also known as soft maple, is probably would not be my first choice just because, as we talked, it's not really hard. I mean, this is, this is made out of uh, sugar maple, hard maple, Northern white, whatever you want to call it, and it still gets dented up quite easily. And I don't, I don't purposely do anything to damage my bench, but just use. So I wouldn't want anything terribly soft. Uh, traditionally, they use European beech. I don't know why, but they do. Over here, we use maple as the number one. So if I was... You would want something that's non-porous, though, right? Yeah. Now, uh, if I was going to give you my <coughs> top three choices for building a bench in North America where you have access to domestic hardwoods, maple would be number one, birch would be number two, and uh, I suppose beech would be number three. You got to stay away from things like ash and oak because they're so poor, so the bench will be filthy in no time. Just unbelievable how dirty. Just look at what happens with an oak floor. In high traffic areas, it just gets black because the stuff gets down in those big open pores. But I would stay away from anything that is is uh, considered soft. And you can look at your your Janka scale to check that out. I was going to tell you where is that right there? I think it's right there somewhere. Let's let's get real technical. Oh boy, we're moving into the next realm. Moose. Where, Jake? Can you point to it? I can't even think of where it is. <coughs> it's not jumping out at me. Well, you, you'll, you'll never find it. Huh? Then you'll never find it. Well, that's too bad. Would have, do you remember where Cherry sat? Uh, Cherry was like 860. So, and Maple was around 1,200? 14. 14. 1460, I think. Ooh, you got those memorized. So cherry would be too expensive, too. Too expensive and too soft. Stick with maple. Same with walnut. Yeah, walnut. It's just too dark. I mean, you don't, that's another thing, too. You want it, you want to be able to see well, so a nice light background. I, I wouldn't want a dark background on the, on the actual work part. Next, Frick. Good question. <clears throat> Jim Cripps in Las Vegas, Nevada. Hi, Jim. He says, what are some of the pros and cons of square dog holes versus round dog holes? Well, so the round dog holes are just super easy to do. Um, I Today I made, I did this one, and it probably took me a half an hour to drill all those holes. I did. We do it for left and right, so somebody has the option, and we put a little uh, quarter round on the top. I were cutting even half that number of square dog holes, that would be a day's work. 
easily, easily a day's work. And advantage. Well, tell you a little more about the round ones. Um, these Schoberg, these Schoberg uh, bench dogs are good. You notice that the spring runs end to end. So it's all, no matter where you want to park it, it's going to stay put at any height. That's a bonus. Um, you, don't have to, you don't have to cant these, meaning they don't have to be drilled on an angle, so I'll explain this. If you had just a regular bench dog and it was sitting in a hole that was bored perpendicular to the face, meaning square, same thing on your vise, when you start clamping something, there's always going to be a little bit of give. So your bench dogs are going to open up like this, and the piece is going to pop up. So you always have to have these dog holes sloping toward the vise, and the one on the vise sloping toward those dog holes, so that, I'm exaggerating it, but they're like this, so that as, they, as you apply force with the vise, they straighten up a little bit, but they don't come perpendicular. And, it'll, and then you can tap the dog down, and pull the work piece tight down to the bench. You don't have to worry about that with these bench dogs because they build that. If you can see, they build that into the face. There's probably about a two, maybe a three degree slope. Did you ever measure it? No. On the face <laughs> of that. So perpendicular hole, <clears throat> it's already got it in there. Speed, ease. Now, why th Why this? I, I used to come up with a lot more ideas, but now I'm just going to say it's just tradition. I can't really think of any advantage of a square bench dog anymore. Well, it is always lined up. What do you mean? If it's always, you don't have to worry well, about it. Well, if you're, if, if you're planing just against the bench dog without clamping in a place, but you know what? Th those don't move either. I'd have to say that uh, unless you're hooked on the traditional aspect of it, go with the round, round bench dog holes. It's a heck of a lot easier to do. And if you wanted to put, if, if you want to cut a chamfer on the top of the square ones, well, now you got to go in and you got to cut each of the corners with by with a chisel by hand. So, yeah, I would still I would still do the square ones, the rectangular ones, because I like the look of it. But if you're building a bench and saying, okay, I want to get this thing done and be able to use it, go with a round. And you're, you're, you're going to have to go out and buy a one-inch, well, you don't have to because you can get three-quarter bench dogs. But if you want a one-inch, you're going to have to buy um, a one-inch drill bit, but not the end of the world. You'd have to buy a three-quarter inch, maybe. Yeah, yeah, most <laughs> people don't carry a three-quarter inch. Next, Frick. Next one comes from Lee Moom in the chat. Hey, Lee. He says, do you find the bolts compress the wood, and how often do you need to retighten them to stop racking? Do, uh, do they compress the wood? Oh, are you, are you, uh, read that question again, please. <clears throat> do you find the bolts compress the wood, and how often do you need to retighten them to stop racking? Okay, so da he always talking about on the base. Uh, yeah, they'll, they'll sink in, but that's why you want to use a big... Get a good, fairly large diameter heavy washer, and you're not going to compress that into the wood. And I don't know. I've never had to retighten. No. I mean, uh, you know, at the end of this year, after we've run through six classes through, we may go through and just check them, and, but they probably won't be have come loose. If your shop is unheated and you're dealing with a, a real swing in, in the environmental uh, not the environmental. What am I trying Humidity to think of? change. Yeah, but what am I? What was the uh, when we rented the places up in Ontario? What was the word they used? Climate. If your ch if your shop has varying climate seasonally, then you may run into a bit of an issue. But I don't think it would be any big deal. What was it going to show them? Oh, I wanted to say I wanted to give a shout out. To uh, Ray Will Willoughby, in who was a Vietnam vet, I spoke to him this afternoon, and I didn't say thank you for your service, Ray. I apologize. Thank you for your service. We appreciate it. Next question, Frick. 
Next question comes from Kev James in the chat. Eb? Kev. 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 I'm thinking of adding a sliding deadman on my workbench. What are your thoughts on these, and are they worth the effort of building this addition? Um, sliding what? Yeah. Uh, well, anything sliding is going to get caked up with sawdust, but I mean, so you, ha you have to clean it. Um, I've never used one. I've never had want for one. So my solution is what was called a bench slave. And that's it there. You can put it anywhere you want. Take the peg out. Move it up or down. On the, uh, the why are my glasses on? On the Cosman workbench, this thing right here, I've, I have taken and I put a filler strip that was the difference between here and here. And I drilled holes in it, and I just put two screws in it so I could take it off if I wanted to. And you can put that on either leg, and you could use that with uh, bench dog holes to support your work. So I, I really don't have an opinion on, on that sliding dead man. You, whether or not it's worth the effort. It's not terribly often that I ever have to use the bench slave. I mean, I have a few times, but uh, normally, I mean, you're setting your piece on here, but I suppose, depending on what you're doing, you may end up having quite a bit of use for, of it, but don't know. That one's up to you. Try it. Let us know. Next, Rick. Next one comes from uh, Eric Allman in St. John, New Brunswick. Eric in St. John. Hey, I'm doing a class, Eric, on Saturday here. An all-day hand plane class. It'll be teaching people how to set up, uh, tune up, set up, sharpen, and use their hand plane. It's an all-day class, including a barbecue lunch. I work with Eric's wife, so maybe I'll. Oh, that's pass along. that's him from Costco. Yeah. Uh, what do you think is the minimum acceptable thickness for a hardwood bench top? Oh, good question. So the very first bench I ever built. Uh, the plans called for three inches, and I didn't have three-inch thick maple. I had inch and seven-eighths, I think. Probably ended up an inch and three-quarter. I thought, certainly this would be heavy enough. Well, <clears throat> after having it all done and using it, I could lean on it out here and actually feel it flex. So my bench top right here is four. Well, it's four on the outside, <clears throat> but it's, it's three. Three, inches, three inches thick. So it's made up of uh, maple boards that are glued together like this, not trying to get a four-inch thick piece of lumber. It was actually, so, what, four, mm. eight quarter? Um, oh, we can measure. I thought it was that ten quarter that I got from... No, it had to be more than eight quarter because it was ten quarter. I had a whole bunch of ten quarter maple. And that's what we made. That's what I made this out of. But you could use four quarter for that matter. Just a whole lot more work. So yeah, better better too thick than not thick enough. It it actually will flex by just you leaning on it. Next question, Frick. Marcus, but three is plenty. Three is plenty. Yeah, I wouldn't go. I I don't think there's any. There, there, what, I no don't reason think to go to four. Uh? No reason to no. go to four. No. The advantage of four over three is not worth whatever the cost would be and the weight. But, I mean, it's not like you move it around a lot either. Unless you have Willie's wonderful wagon wheels that fit on our bench. To and Willie knows who, knows who he is. Next, Frick. Marcus uh, White. And yes, I need a haircut. Is the comment coming up yet? Yeah. It's, yeah. Oh, give me a break. <laughs> Someday. Uh, Marcus White in the chat says, can Rob speak to the finish options for the Cosman workbench? Yeah. So if you look at this one right here, this has a polished lacquered finish. And it's really nice. It's really slick. Don't know if I would want that. Sometimes too slick. Um, so the ones that we, we've used an oil finish. Only problem with an oil finish is the edges of the MDF just keep soaking it in and soaking it in and soaking it in. If if three coats would do on the top, you'd need seven or eight coats on the edge before it stopped just 
the minute you put it on, it dries it right out. However, the advantage of the oil coat, I'm talking a tongue oil, is that you don't need any fancy equipment. You can do it with a foam brush. As long as you have time, it's, it'll work fine. The only reason, and on the MDF in particular, is just to prevent glue from sticking to your bench top. And uh, as it's inevitable that at some point you're going to get glue on your bench, whether you're doing a dovetail and putting it together in the vise or, or you're doing a glue up on your bench, which I try not to do, but I end up doing sometimes. So you just want it not, you want it so that it doesn't stick and you can easily get it off. And of course, it protects your bench a little bit, a little bit of moisture resistance, although MDF is like a sponge just dying for moisture. So you get water on it, it's almost inevitable it's going to puff up if you don't get it off immediately. So option number one is an oil finish, a tongue oil, any kind of an oil finish, and just do the edges um, four or five times before you even start to do the top and bottom. And you always want to do it all the way around. Option number two is a spray of lacquer, which is what we do now. What am I talking about? When was the last time we did some? I guess whatever benches we've done, we the last... Yeah dozen or so benches that we've made, we sprayed it. And we go around and we spray the edges multiple times until it stops soaking it in. And then we spray the top and the bottom two or three times. And it's a, it's a, it's a fast, pretty durable finish. And yeah, that's it. Brick those, switch. those are two options. Next, Rick. Uh, the other camera's frozen, Jake. Next, Rick. Next one comes from Kyle Rogers in Queensland, Australia. Hey, Kyle. He says, would the casters that you sell for the Cosman workbench manage the weight of the new Baltic birch bench and the weight Easily. of your Scandinavian bench? Yeah, yeah. Uh, this bench? I think yeah. so. We, we <laughs> really, we, uh, <coughs> Willie does a great job on them. He really beefs them up. So, ow. We, here, you look at it. So there's what it comes with, just that crimp piece right there, and that bends. So Willie goes on and, and doubles that up and welds on another piece, and we haven't had one bend as a result. So that Baltic birch top, by the way, is probably not much heavier than the MDF, if it even, it's probably the same weight, if it'd be within a few pounds. This one, I don't move it around at all, so I don't have them on it, but it would hold it. I know they, 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 as they come, they're rated for 105 pounds. 125, I think. 125 pounds each. That's not true. But I'm, I'm pretty sure that they're worth 150 pounds as they are or more. And that bench weighs, what's the shipping weight on that? Maybe 150. Yeah. So you're, you got, you've got lots of, uh, lots of leeway. It'll work. Have you decided on the price of the Cosman workbench when you sell it? No. Well, we're, so right, what, what I've been doing all day today is developing the methods. You can't do them as a one-off because nobody could afford that. So I have to develop the procedure, unlike the one on the video where we were just doing one. We've got to have it figured out so that we can make multiples and you can... Uh, benefit from the economy of scale because it's going to be a, I mean it's got to be affordable but at the same time when we were buying one we in a six month period one inch baltic birch no was it one inch baltic birch went from correct me if i'm wrong 109 dollars a sheet the next time we got a quote on it was 211 or something yeah like it doubled <coughs> it doubled overnight now they're telling me that those prices are going to come down but I believe it when i see it so we don't know. We don't know when, as soon as we get it figured out, that's always the toughest part. You, you want to be fair, but you can't operate your business unprofitably. That doesn't benefit anybody, including me. Next, Rick, please. Yep, next one comes from uh, Thomas Heron in Redding, California. Hey, Thomas. He says, can you talk about the function of the inlay strip along the dog holes? Yeah. Yeah, it was an accident. Uh, this happened in my very first bench. <clears throat> and so this is, this is called the dog strip. And it, it uh, goes from here to here. 
So this piece of the bench is three inches thick. This piece is four inches thick. Four inches to give you the extra support for the bench dog, should it need it. So it's this piece of wood right here, and it runs from there to there. And then you cut your dados in there. And then you go in and clean out the bottoms. And you glue this piece on. And that creates that cavity for each of the bench dogs. And then this gets glued onto the side. There's three, two splines. Two splines that align this dog strip to that piece. Anyway, after I had built it, it developed a crack, a gap, right down through that glue line. Oh, I was devastated. What am I going to do with this? So... The old adage is, if you can't hide it, make a feature of it. Take your lemon and turn it into lemonade. So I put this, and I'd already had, the first bench I had had bloodwood accents on maple. So the back, the back of the tool tray was bloodwood, which made the dovetail stand out. And the pins that support the dovetail and the handle and, a few, and the vise were all out of bloodwood. So I decided to just... Uh, take the router and cut a groove that length and set in a piece of blood wood and we'll call it a racing stripe. Well, as it turned out, it became very effective. If I'm putting a piece of wood in the vise and I want it to be level, instead of having to grab my level, all I have to do is just eyeball this top edge to that and Bob's your uncle. So it was such a great mistake that when I built this bench, I purposely threw that in there. And then I put a strip along there and one down there and just, just, um, I don't like doing things for mere decoration, decorative value. <coughs> I like doing it if it has a purpose. And if it has a purpose, then accentuate it. So I did. That's where it came from. Next, Frick. Uh, okay, next one comes from... Blue Knight in the chat. What's his name? Blue Knight. Blue Knight? He's here all the time. He, uh, he always has good questions. For hey, someone who, yeah, for someone who has little room, have you, have you ever made a workbench like a Murphy bed, the ones that fold up into the wall, and would that be possible? Uh, no, I haven't, but you could certainly... Uh, uh, so now my... my Mine's racing. So what I would do is I would hinge one side of this to the wall and the other side, I guess if you lifted it up, if you hinged it so that it lifted up like this and this leg, this whole outside piece that's facing me, two stretchers and, and a leg on either end would come down into position and hold that level. So yeah, no, I haven't, but yes, you could. Frick bench. Or you could buy some uh, some of our bench dogs and just move it around. Are we on oh, the other camera now? Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. Frick, how many do we have on? 568. All right, so let me do the introduction. <clears throat> Evening, folks. We've been in full swing for the last... <clears throat> half an hour. Half an hour, but I, now that we have a bunch of people here, I'll tell you where we are or what we're doing. So tonight's theme is building a workbench, and we repeat that one at least twice each year because there's always people either coming into the craft realizing gut of a bench or people that have been in it that are saying, I need a better bench. So it's a good topic, and I love doing it. Um, what we do tonight, or the reason we do this every second Saturday night, even though this is two in a row, but that's because Frick has a conflict for the next two Saturdays. We run a uh, Purple Heart project, which is a program we started in 2016 in Niagara Falls, Ontario. We now have it run it here. And it allow, what we do is we bring in combat wounded veterans from all over the world, uh, whether they've been mentally wounded or were a physical wound, <clears throat> and we bring them in. No expense to them. We cover airfare, hotel, meals. We teach to give them a six-day, very intense hand tool workshop along with, we do seven combat wounded vets, along with seven civilian students who come in and uh, mingle. We're here from 7 in the morning until 10, 10.30, 11 o'clock at night. We have our three meals here, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And in that week, in that six days, we learn to sharpen freehand our planes and chisels. 
We learn to saw proficiently so that we can cut a hand cut a dovetail and join it right from the saw. We, can, we learn to cut a through wedge tenon. We learn to cut a mortise, uh, um, through wedge mortise and tenon, we, a regular mortise. Um, we learn to plain wood without the need of sandpaper. We learn to dimension wood, which means make it so that you can accurately square and flatten and smooth a piece of, a wide piece of timber. The idea is to eliminate sandpaper. And we do that because, unbeknown to me at the time, Woodworking, woodworking with hand tools is very therapeutic. It's very calming. It also um, requires 100% of your, uh, your faculties. You can't daydream while you're cutting a dovetail. You can't even carry on a conversation, unless you're me, because I've done it all my life. But I'm used to just talking while I'm doing it. But it, it brings these guys a, a zero, an intense focus, and that helps us control their mind and the thoughts that they have and I don't know what I'm talking about. I just know how to teach it. But we send each vet home with about $4,000 worth of tools, the same brands that I have behind me, same thing I use. Plus, we build them a bench. Or we, have a, we have an organization called the Bench Brigade headed up by um, Jack Lane down in, down in Texas. And I'll give a big shout out to uh, Stella and Jim Rossetti up in Moncton, New Brunswick, and um, Chris Chahusky, who helps with the delivery. And those guys organize a, a volunteer group that's some 200 plus people spread all over, I think, six countries. And those individuals join our group and uh, they take it upon themselves with our plans. They build a bench. This is where this one came from. They build a bench, procuring the materials. We send them the vice, the bench dogs, the plans. And then Jack or Jim coordinate it so that the individual building it can quite possibly personally deliver it to the vet that is waiting for the bench to complete his workshop. Now, this used to be expensive. <laughs> now it's even more. In fact, we've got to go through and sit down and figure out what it's actually costing, not that it's going to change what we do, but you probably want to know how much it's costing. We used to figure it was uh, about $3,500, but that was a long time ago. Plane fares uh, more than doubled. Um, the tool cost, I mean, we give them $4,000 worth of tools. So where the $3,500 figure ever came from, I wasn't sure. We used to have some companies that donate, donated tools as well, but we do it all now ourselves. So back to my point. The reason we do this is to A, raise awareness. B, it enables those of you out there who aren't close by can't volunteer to come make cookies or help in the shop during the class, get to participate financially. And you can, uh, you can help in any way that you want. I do it because of the way it makes me feel when I help these people, and you can get the same feeling. Uh, you can go on our website, robcosman.com, underneath the PHP banner on the left side, it says, how can I help? And it'll show you how you can donate in there, whatever amount that you want. And... Uh, and that's how we finance it. We started off just digging deep in our pocket and taking a percentage of our tool sales. And uh, we did it because we knew it had to be done. I didn't know how we were going to pay for it. I just figured, you know what, we'll just do it and somehow something will happen. And it did. And people started to step up and say, you know what, I'd like to participate. And uh, it was a lot of people donating a little bit. In some cases, a few people donating a whole lot. But we've managed to do it. And I think we're now... I think our donations sustain it. So, at the end of the night, we're going to give away prizes. We always do. I work with three, four combat wounded vets who have been through our program. Jeff O'Connor, O'ConnorWoodworking.com. Kevin Burris, BurrisWoodworking.com. Danny Bell, soon to be Danny Bell.com. Bell, uh, What's Danny's website? Danny Bell Woodworks. Danny Bell Woodworks. And, uh, and Bob Abbott. And that is the vintage veteran. vintageveteran.com. So what I do is I buy stuff that they make and sell. We buy it whole retail, retail, and then we give it away. So Jeff makes these, uh, these wonderful shave brushes made out of badger, badger bum hair. 
and uh, comes with shave soap and a bowl that he turns. He also makes these kiss sticks, kiss Irish kiss sticks. Used to be a Chicago policeman before he joined the military, so you might understand the history behind that. Kevin, on the other hand, we still didn't get Kev's fish and tackle boxes. Kevin now makes uh, fly boxes, fly boxes. He also does these plaques out of slate and granite, either or. And then this is laser engraved. This is, uh, that's uh, Omaha Beach, D-Day. I've got one over there. It's Canadian flag with a Canadian warship. He'll do just about any scene you want on the back, with the backdrop of a flag. And um, Danny will soon, we're holding on. It's a big secret. Danny will soon have something that we can give away as well. So for every $1,000 that, do that, get, that gets donate, we'll give away one of those prizes. And... We also always give away three dead cat sweaters. And uh, just go back and look at our previous issues. You'll find out what a dead cat sweater is. It's the warmest and the lightest garment you'll ever have. Although I saw my father at the hockey game the other night wearing his. I'm thinking, does he not know it's July? And Moose is here. And Moose operates, he and his wife operate a business called uh, patssecretgarden.com. Frick will put the link up. And uh, that's where the dead cat sweaters come from. So you can go on there and check it out for yourself. And he had his supplier do the Purple Heart logo on there, which really personalizes it. So that's why we're here. Next, Frick. Please and thank you. Uh, Kent Boyce in uh, Southampton, Ontario. Hey, Ken. He says, can you explain how you make the bench dog holes? What are the important points in the process to follow and the tools you use? Uh, the bench dog holes in the rectangular ones? I don't know. I assume you mean the other ones are easier. Okay, well, I'll, I'll cover both because this one's easy. So these ones, it's just a, it's just a whole a one-inch diameter bit bored straight down through. The only thing you want to make sure is that when you bore your holes that you're going to clear that side stretcher. So you can't be, you don't want to be too far, far too close to the edge because the thing about MDF is it only has strength with, when it's in a big chunk. So if you get too close, you're going to run the risk of damaging that. So you want to be in there far enough that you have a enough meat here, I'd say at least an inch, but you got to make sure that you clear that stretcher so your bench dog will go all the way down through. And I, I always put a little quarter round on the top side just to protect it. MDF doesn't do well on sharp edges. Now, if you're talking about these, so I uh, kind of covered this already, but I'll, I'll hit the highlights. So I've got a piece of material. I'm talking about this piece right here. Can you? Can they see me well enough? Since Jake's gone. Uh, not really. No. Well, all right. On this bench, the out the piece closest to me is called the dog strip, and it consists of two pieces of maple. The first piece, the piece I'm going to talk about, is an inch and a half wide by four inches. Pardon me, an inch and a half thick by four inches wide. And it runs essentially the length of the bench. Actually, that's not true. It runs, in this case, 59 and a half inches. It stops right here where that movable jaw is. And I take this first piece and using my dado with, uh, now I use my dado head, which is a stackable dado. That means it's two outside blades and a bunch of chippers in the middle. And I put spacers in there to get what would normally be the maximum you could cut would be 13 sixteenths. I cut one inch with mine. And I do that because if you have to move it, meaning if you have to make two passes, chances are you're not going to get them all the same, and then your, your bench dogs are not going to fit as well because one will be a little bit smaller. It always happens. That's going to leave some rabbit ear, rabbit ear grooves on the far side or the top of the... Uh, table saw blade if you're running it over top of them which you would have to so I use my router plane and my router plane is patterned after an old Stanley number 70 71 71 and that you, you can your cutter drops down below and you can get all the way down there and that just allows you to go in and clean this up so that you get rid of all those little grooves cut by the uh extra long ears on the outside of the blades of the dado set. And these are also canted. So when I run them over the blade, I usually take two miter gauges and I join them with a strip, 
a strip of wood, and it's on about a, a three degree slow angle, so that these grooves are cut. If I was to put my, if I was to put my protractor down there, I was to put my protractor down there. It shows up as three degrees. So there's a three degree slope pointing toward the vise, and then in the vise, there's a three degree slope pointing toward the bench dogs. And that's all there is to it. Glue this extra piece on so that uh, you have a nice captured hole. And that's, if you tried to mortise those out, my goodness, it'd be there forever in a day. So those are all cut with the dado, and then this piece is added on. Of course, you've got, I always put, two splines so I've got an eighth inch spline that's probably can't even see it maybe a half an inch below the surface and an eighth inch spline half an inch below the opposite edge corresponding grooves on the other piece so when you put it together everything lines up nicely and piece of cake done okay next Rick yeah this oh one. I, I, I want to just say uh, I want to give an update on, uh, so if you know Jack Lane, and if you know me, you know Jack Lane. Jack has a great-granddaughter who was born three months ago? Uh, four months ago. Has it been four months? Uh, sh no, she's 14 <laughs> weeks old. 14 weeks. Do the, do the month. What's that, three, three and, and, and a half, half. months? Yeah. She'd be a little over three months. She mm -hmm. was born just over one pound. And she's now coming up on four pounds. She's well, four. He just sent me a message. So she was considered a nano preemie and then a micro preemie. And then finally this week, a regular premature. A regular preemie. Yeah. She weighs I didn't know there were so many steps. She a weighs nano, uh, a micro and a regular full preemie. She weighs four pounds, 11 ounces. And wow. She's finally on the growth chart. Wow. Stella! Four pounds, 11 ounces. She's almost, well, I don't think they would send a baby home that small if it was born, if it came full term, that, but she's getting close. How much, how, how big was Lincoln when he was born? He was four pounds, four ounces, I believe. Oh! She's and good. He was eight weeks early. She's a beast. Yeah, that's great news. Wonderful news. Um, and... You notice right here Frick switch. is Angie, and Angie is Ken's cousin. Angie and her sister Lynn do all the packaging of the Purple Heart t-shirts, and that's Angie proudly displaying her work, and she, uh, when she packages it up, there'll be a little picture of her with her A on there, seal of approval. Hi, Angie. Great news about Stella. All right, Frick. Where are we uh, headed? Okay. Did I forget anybody? Who's that? Is Luz, did Luther show up? Uh, yes, he has. Howdy, Luther. He'll be here soon. Our next class, by the way, starts on July 24th. Is 24th the Sunday? Yeah. So on t so Sunday the 24th at 7 o'clock, we will be having a freaking good barbecue with our seven combat wounded vets and seven civilians that will be here for class Number three of this year and class number 16? 16. 16. PHP number 16. We have had 109 combat wounded vets, both male and female, run through our program. So this will bring the number up to 116. Looking forward to it. That's July 24th. Following then uh, we have a week off. Well, a week break, and then our next class will be coming in the first, uh, first of August. And we have one coming in September and one in October. So full steam ahead. And big shout out to all the boys from the last two classes. I hope you're keeping your tools sharp. I'm starting to sound like Don Cherry. Next just need break. the suit. Um, just need the suit. Yeah, we're not going to do that. Um, this is my suit. Mark Bitroloff in Georgia. Hey, Mark. I'm sure I'm... It's hot it. in Georgia. Hot and humid. Oh, my. He says, I'm going to be building your MDF bench. What do you think about a melamine layer on the surface? Eh. Would, it, would it hold up? Nah. No, melamine, melamine is just not tough enough. I mean, it looks good the first 
time you use it, but as soon as you start to break through, it's uh, ugly. Nice thing about the MDF, if you scratch it, if you cut into it accidentally, you take a little bit of cyanacrylate and you just saturate it with the thin cyanacrylate. That's the, uh, that's the watery one, which I have a bottle of. This is thick. Oh, look at that. I get to sew all three. So here's, and this, by the way, is the best, well, I don't know if it's the best brand. I think they're all the same, but I like the, I like the price of them. So there is the thin, and you can see it's just like water. Here's the medium. That would be like maple syrup. And this is the thick. And this would be yeah, a little less than molasses. Now, as they age, they'll get thicker. So if you keep them in the fridge, it'll last longer. So you take that thin one and... Uh, you just, I got one to fix right here. Oh, yeah. Ah. Never mind. Oh, wait a minute now. I'll open up my tool cabinet, and to my surprise, I'll pull open one of these beautiful drawers and look at all my wrenches that I used to spend a week. Have I now not? Now you spend a week getting them out. <laughs> well, we haven't done this one yet. <coughs> no. See, we, we need went in and we cut finger holes so we could get access to these ones. I got to do this one next. So instead, I'll grab these pliers so I can grab those pliers. That's why I put those ones right there. Shh. I'm just going to break the seal, hopefully. I'm trying to keep one from opening while the other one. Use the vice grips. If you've never worked with this stuff before, a few warnings. Number one, don't get it on you because it'll instantly bond your skin. Wear glasses. And the smell when it's curing is enough to make your eyes water. That dog yeah. is upside down. So I'm sure there's a something poisonous in it so just be aware probably the asbestos of 2020 so there's a couple of scars right here don't know what happened but what i'll do is just let that cyanacrylate soak in now if it makes it swell at all i can go ahead and shape it afterward But that will stiffen up the surface just like it was new. You can also take cyanacrylate and soak at least the top part of the dog hole, and that'll stiffen that up. And people ask me quite frequently, can you use a uh, hold down in this hold stuff? Fast. Hold fast. And uh, I haven't. But if you soak the cyanacrylate in there, there shouldn't be any reason why you can't. Next, Rick. Uh, Gary Cooper in Kansas City. Hey, Gary. What is the minimum recommended bench thickness to support bench dogs? What's the minimum thickness for supporting a bench dog? Yep. Well, that one is three inches. This one is four inches. Um, depending on how well they fit, the better they fit, the less you would need. But I, I don't think I'd want to go less than two and a half inches. I typically keep my bench dogs low for that reason as opposed to having them sitting way up here where they put a whole lot of pressure on it. Keep the leverage down by keeping them low, low in the vise. You don't want to hit them with your bench, your plane anyway. Next, Rick. Uh, Jim Travers in Aurora, Ontario. Hey, Jim. I have a 70-year-old solid maple workbench that I've restored. 70. What, what finish would you recommend? Um, well, I would, I, I would oil it. I, I really like, uh, do we have it here? I don't think so. Let me look and see. I really like this product that you can get at home hardware. 
and it's made by, uh, um, what's the name of the company, Jake? Circa 1850. Circa 1850. I don't have it here. It's in a kind of a yellow can with red accent writing on it. And it's a tongue oil finish, which means it's not just tongue oil. It's got dryers and whatever in it. But I really like it. I like, I just like it. So I use it. And uh, I like finding something that works and I stick with it because then you get a little bit of expertise with it and uh, you come to expect and know how it's going to perform. You can thin it with lacquer, with a, uh, with mineral spirits. And the reason I would say that is because it might slow the drying down, make it a little easier to apply, especially on a bench. You've got a large surface to do and you don't want to get in tacky on one end before you've even done putting it on the other. So I would, I would always do that. So that's, that's how I would do it. But uh, if you want to finish, finish, you need at least three coats, possibly three, possibly four or five coats. And by that, what I, by that I mean, if I were to put one coat on there, it's, it just makes it look wet. It makes it look darker, but it feels like there's nothing on there at all. And the second coat doesn't do much better. By the third, really the fourth coat, you start to feel like, okay, there's a finish on there. You didn't follow the instructions. You've got a, at least a day in between. But the nice thing about an oil finish is that even though it takes more time, you don't have to have a spray booth. You don't have to have spray equipment. You can do it in your living room if your wife doesn't catch you. Next, Rick. Uh, Len Piazza in Trophy Club, Texas. In coat, in what? Trophy Club, Texas. Trophy Club. Sounds nice. Len's his first name? Yeah. Helen Piazza. What are your thoughts on using a random orbital sander instead of a handheld belt sander like you use throughout your bench video? Well, when did we use when did we use a belt sander? Oh, we did the edges. Oh, uh, actually, I was using it today. So, in preparing this this edge to get rid of the uh, the ripple marks from the jointer, I use a belt sander on it. Uh, a belt sander is faster. It's more aggressive. It does take. It take. You have to know what you're doing with a belt sander because because it's aggressive. You can destroy stuff. Not only can you get the job done faster, you can also destroy it quicker. A round, ram, random orbital sander. Um, so on a belt sander, you have what's called a platen. So if take that off. So, this uh, shiny piece of metal has a piece of cork in there, and your wood is, um, you know, you've got your sanding belt here and your wood here, or your, your what am I talking about? The sanding belt is between this hard plate and, and, the, and the wood. So, when you sand with a belt sander, the sandpaper is not going to wear away the soft grain at a faster or slower rate than the harder grain. With a random orbital sander, this I find that it'll, especially on something like a piece of red oak, that it'll it'll dish out the soft grain quite rapidly and leave the hard summer wood, and then you get this wavy feel. So I prefer this probably because it's faster, but I think it does a better job if you have some experience with it and know how to use it. The, the, the big downside to these is that they are never balanced. So I'm going to set this. That is sitting in the middle of the belt. Okay. Here, let's get this right. Tell me when it's in the middle, Jake. Of the belt? Yeah. Right about there. Right about there. You look on the back. Okay. So here it is sitting in the middle of the belt. If I let go... It's pretty balanced. No. It's, it's not pretty balanced. The cord is doing it. It's always heavy on the side where the belt is. Not this belt, but the belt between the motor and that back drive pulley. So when you sand, you always have to be compensating for that, and that takes a little bit. If not, you're going to wear one side more than the other. So it's an awkward tool. Not, not, on, my not on my list of... Uh, Top 10 power tools to own. 
And most people don't use it enough to ever get um, proficient with it. I, don't, where, I, don't, I can't remember what, what it was that I was doing that I ended up using them a lot. But I, uh, I had an old one when I first started using it. I had an old one, and I used to, uh, I just used some hose clamps, and I clamped a weight on over here so that that would balance, and I find it worked it worked a lot better. I don't know why they do, somebody that manufactures it doesn't do, have some kind of a counterweight on one side just so that it doesn't do that, but they don't. You should do a video on that, Jake. How to use a belt sander without destroying things. Next, Rick. Paul Bedell in Brackendale, BC. Paul? Yep. In, and where is he in BC? Brackendale. Brackendale. Don't know where that was. Um, Hi, Paul. What are Rob's recommendations for vice chop linings? Leather, sticky, one side, cork, adhesives? Uh, leather. Uh, leather because it's, and you'll see mine, my, mine, mine all, I've always used leather. Relatively thick leather. It's just, one of the reasons is it's going to protect your wood, so far less likely to put a mark on there. Another reason is that it will improve the grip. So, you know, you don't have to have a whole lot of pressure in order for that to stay put. And it sticks on with uh, just regular glue. And when it comes time, you can actually peel it off quite easily to put a new piece on. The problem with cork is just not terribly durable. So we are actually now, yes, no? We, we are making jaws for the Cosman Vice that will be made to apply right onto your... Right. I, I realize a lot of people don't have access to uh, a shop. They're trying to woodwork from their condominium bedroom. So we'll, we're going to supply this piece that will be cut to fit. It'll have a leather face already glued on there and all ready to go. So leathers, the leather, I think, is the way to go. Next, Rick. Joe Phillips in King George, Virginia. Hey, Joe. Have you considered an inset wheel vice modification for the Cosman workbench? An inset... Wheel vice modification for the Cosman workbench. Okay, I think what he's talking about is this. So, um, and if I'm wrong, you speak up. So this is often called a wagon wheel vice. So it's this two-inch wide block, two-inch by eight-inch block. that has got two bench dogs in it. And this screw just moves it forward and back, and it works great. However, the purpose of the Cosman workbench was to design a, a bench that could be built by a brand new woodworker that has very few tools and uh, not a tremendous capacity, both skill and equipment and space. Hence, Cosmo Workbench, made out of materials that you can buy at the big box store. Um, our video will show you, you can do it with very few clamps. You can do it with a skill saw. And the vise that we use, which really inspired this whole thing because I found the vise first. The vise is made by Schoberg over in Denmark. And it takes, is it fair to say 15 minutes to install? Yeah. Half hour at the most. It's a very quick install. The whole vice, now with the exception of this piece of wood, the vice bolts to the bottom side with eight, eight, eight lag bolts. Uh, you've got to drill one hole for the nut that the uh, screw runs on, Don't, not very deep. And then there's two little holes that you cut back here. There's two little metal tabs on the back side that resist the pulling action when you're tightening up the vice. And there's two screws on either side that you can take all the slop out of this so it doesn't rack on you at all. Biggest single advantage is they make it out of tube, pardon me, rectangular tube instead of round tube, which really does a lot to uh, improve the accuracy of it and eliminate any of that racking. And then you mount your jaw on the, on the front. And wow, it's just, it's a great vice for a beginner. It's a great vice for a serious woodworker. It's... So, no, I haven't gone in to modify. And the problem is, as I mentioned earlier when I was talking about the dog holes, 
The downside to MDF is it doesn't have any strength when you get down into thin pieces. When it's one big mass like that, it's plenty strong. But if you started cutting it to where you had a narrow piece, uh, I would worry about it at that point. So I haven't done anything to modify the vice setup on that for that reason. Next for it. This one's from Ken in La Caruna, Spain. What's his name? Ken. Ken in, in Spain? Spain, yep. Hi, Rob. How much glue okay. do you need for the top NDF and the plywood legs and stretches? How much glue do you need for the ant for the bench, right? Mm hmm Do we use liter? Do you use a liter? I, I wouldn't well <laughs> you don't want to run out. Um, I would I, think if you had a liter, what is that what the is that what the that bottle is? Well maybe is that five maybe, that's five hundred mil, isn't it? Maybe a pint would do. What's this? That's a liter. That's a liter? No, no, you wouldn't need a liter. I Half think of that. Pint. The pint bottle would do. I thought I had one. Yeah. A liter to be sure. Um, I don't. I'm. I'm almost positive you wouldn't use a half a liter. But as like I said, I wouldn't want to be in a situation where I needed another teaspoon and I was out. So go with a liter and you're good. Next, Rick. Next one is from Rob in Ontario. Hey, Rob. He says I'm building a bench with the wood. I'm building a bench with the wood I have. A three inch thick laminated cherry top. What joint do you suggest to connect the base to the top? What joint to connect the base to the top? Um, well, bolt. Yeah, we just use lag bolts. Um, so this one, this one, there is a single dowel in the middle. So there's a dowel at the top of this trestle and there's a dowel at the top of that trestle and it's right in the middle. That way all of your expansion can happen without interrupting or being constricted by the trestle which doesn't move this way at all. Um, did I put anything else in there? Actually, I reinforced that. I did. There was a dowel in there. I put a, I put a, uh, a lag bolt up in there and that's all I needed. Now on these... On these, we put a bolt up through, a lag bolt up through the middle of the tr this stretcher and middle of that stretcher and, and secure it to the bottom side of this, which I think will help to prevent any sagging over time. And actually, they use four. So there's one in the middle of this going up in, one on each one of the stretchers and one down there. And that secures it wonderfully. You don't have to worry about that moving. I, and I'm not, I'm, uh, if, if I'm missing some part of that question, you're welcome to throw in another one. Next, Rick. We covered, we covered the uh, prizes for tonight. Said hello to Angie. Is Ken on? Yep. Ken? Good to have Ken on. Is Super Dave on? I haven't seen him. Uh, any any vets on that? Oh, that's yeah, yeah, Kevin Burris, uh, hey, Kev. Bob, Bob Abbott, and uh, Jeff O'Connor are all. Robert, Jeff, good men. So if you are one of the vets that has been to our class, we always love to know you're there and give you a big shout out. What are we using your your name, Frick? Uh, sure. You're short staffed, I guess. Yeah. So what you're going to do is you're going to go in the chat. You're going to put at. Frick, your name and when you were in our class, and he'll give he'll tell me, and uh, we'll we'll draw on our memory banks to say hello to you. Those are the only three you've seen so far. Yeah, I'm sure there's been others, but I haven't really been writing them down. So Bob Bob made the uh, tumbling block cutting board, and we got a moose cutting board in there too. Am I going to give him his cutting board tonight? Take it home with him. Actually, it's right here. I don't think he was ever here to present it, was he? Moose. Moose. When you were laying around the hospital trying to get out of work, yeah. <laughs> Bob made something for you. It's been sitting in here in pristine condition. This is a moose cutting board huh. from Bob Abbott. There you go. 
take it home and cut up some moose. Ruin it. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Bob. Check out Bob's work at thevintageveteran.com. Next, Rick. All right, next it comes from Chris Sanego in Cape Coral, Florida. Hey, Chris. He says, have you, have you considered putting a rolling drawer down. underneath your Cosman bench? I just built one, and it's a great, it's a great space and looks great. Say, uh, what, was it? what did he call it? A rolling drawer. A rolling drawer. Can we go out there and show him what we did? Yeah. Chris, if, if, if our uh, audio stays, pardon the mess. It's always like this in between classes. So what we're doing right now in the online workshop is we, are, we built this unit that slides in that opening. It's accessible from both sides. So the drawers, you can open from this side. You can also open them from the other side. We've got a magnet right there, coincides with another magnet inside that stops it in the middle. Nothing in those. And then we have two doors, one on this side, one on that side, so that you can get at it from both sides. That needs to be fit. Anyway, so four drawers on each side. That's made out of Baltic birch and Douglas fir with pine drawer sides. And all kinds of space to oh, put here's stuff. The, here's the vice drawer. What? This has, is this one with the leather? Oh, yeah. So here's the vice jaw we're talking about. It's made out of maple. And there's a nice piece of heavy leather that's glued in place. And it'll work just nicely. So I think I can answer your question and say yes, we have. Next, Rick. Uh, this one comes from Larry Deason in Louisville, Kentucky. Hey, Larry. I've been to Louisville. How many leg screws should you use to attach the bench top? I've seen one on each side in plans and others have up to three on each side i have to move my bench frequently meaning you gotta take it apart i think you can get away with two if you want you can use four so there's one going up through the middle of each stretcher and there's one going up through the middle of each each trestle up in so that's four don't need any more than that and so the, the only thing about putting a lag bolt into MDF is make sure you, I would say that you want to get in at least, if yours is made out of three pieces of MDF, you want to get your lag bolt in at least two pieces. Don't get anywhere near the top. you got to make sure that your pilot hole is a little bit deeper than the lag is because you get up to here, and if that lag bolt is longer than the hole is deep, it'll separate that MDF on you. Remember, MDF has lots of limitations. Its advantages are that it's heavy and flat and stable. Its disadvantages in small quantity, it has very little strength. It has very little screw holding strength coming in from the edge. The inner core is relatively soft. So you've got to know that and avoid those things or work around them. Next, Fred. Um, Kim in Kelowna. Hey, Kim. Pros and cons, Scandinavian shoulder vice versus Rubo leg vice. Don't like the Rubo leg, my leg vice. So what I appreciate most and the reason why I enjoy this, actually, you know what, let me answer it this way. Then I'll give my, ta my take. So there's two woodworkers that are the most well-known hand tool woodworkers of the last 40 years in North America, in the world, really. And uh, one is Frank Klaus who was trained in Austria, a traditional apprenticeship, and the other is uh, Tay Frid, who was trained in, in uh, Sweden through a traditional um, apprentice program. Both of those gentlemen were well known for their use of hand tools, and I, I say that because they were, they were trained at a time when hand tools were still a big part of how you did things. You, you used power tools to do the part that needed to be done by power tools, but the finesse was always done with hand tools. So proficiency in hand tools was a must. And they both use a Scandinavian shoulder vise, and that's what this is. So I don't care what anybody else says, the most, two most reputable guys in that field use the same vise. Big advantage, there's nothing in the way. 
So you clamp your piece. It holds it securely. It clamp. It, there's no racking involved. Um, this is designed to move this way so that if you were clamping a piece that, that wasn't a rectangle, it was tapered, it will still hold firm. Um, yes, if you had something way out here, but then I would go in and clamp underneath to give it a little extra support if I needed it. You d it doesn't run all the way through like a traditional face vise does, but I've never had that. I've never had that as a serious downside. Uh, the leg vise, I've only used a Rubo bench once, and uh, just you know, there's there are some implications. There are some issues with not having clearance all the way down. My first shop that I was in for 30 years, I had a I was on the second floor. And I had a trap door right here. So at any time that I needed to cut dovetails in the end of a 12-foot board, I could move, open the trap door, drop that down, and hold it securely. And that was a huge advantage because I, I used to make stuff that would be dovetailed and would be really long sides that would be very difficult today doing it here. So my only option outside of your first bench to get you going is to use a Scandinavian shoulder vise. Nothing else comes close, in my opinion. Good question. Next, Frick. Tim in Rhode Island. Hi, Tim. Uh, do, you do, do you do anything to organize your lower shelf? I feel like mine is always just turns into a collection of random stuff. My what? My what? Your lower you shelf? Really have one. Lower shelf? Is oh, down underneath the there? No, I don't even have one for that very reason. Well, actually, I do. I've got some veneer in there that's been sitting there for probably a year. But if I, had, if I had a shelf down there, it would look like the rest of the top. It would be a mess because Jake, Jake works on here all the time and leaves his stuff because I'm neat. Just the other day, I left my ring boxes there. Yeah, see that? Always has junk laying around. Get your own bench. Turned his bench into a desk. Next frick, please. Okay. I'm running low here. What's that? Uh, Nathan Dearth in Austin, Texas. Hey, Nathan. He says, I've seen a few people try to simplify the Scandinavian workbench build by removing the end caps and cross-grain construction. How would you personally build the wagon vise and attach the tool tray? Uh, so they're talking about moving, removing the end caps, and that, that's, that's fine. However, how are you going to get at this? I suppose you could just as easily you could just as easily have just glued a block in there and put your nut on that. So that wouldn't be a big deal. Right? So imagine this is gone. You gotta have the nut held somewhere. So if you would put a block in here, run grain running the same direction. And secure that. You could put the you could put the nut on the other side of it, so that would work. How would you secure your tool tray? Well, uh, come out here. We've added uh, tool trays because we had a class with Neil we Wheel Netherhead, and uh, who were some of the guys that were so fast in that class, Jake? Um, Brian Beckman, Jeff O'Connor. Jeff, Jeff didn't make one of those. He did. Is there one there with Jeff? Oh, speedy Jeff? And uh, Bry Christensen. Yeah? So we had a class, these guys, it was Jeff's class, that's right, too, because Jeff inspired everybody in the class to, to do their best. He was fantastic. Um, we also have one by Jake Tarola and uh, Charles. So these guys were way ahead. And I was running out of stuff for them to do. So I said, you know what? We could use tool trays on all the benches. So we had them do the tool trays. So it's a dovetailed piece. Um, you know, they, they, they used different colored woods just for the accent. And then the bottom, the bottom is a piece of half-inch Baltic birch. It sits in a groove on this side, on here, on here. But then it runs back to about here. And then it's just screwed from the bottom side. So it's the piece of plywood, half inch piece of Baltic birch plywood that is holding it to the bench. And this is just butted up against it. And uh, it, it works fine. Whose is that? Oh, Nick. 
Nick Brown from from uh, right here in New Brunswick. So Jake's been going through. Do you want to show yours off? No. No? It's not done. Not, you're not ready for prime time? It's not done. So you can do that. You could easily add your tool tray that way. I don't have one of mine. You can't. Why? Yeah, I can. Uh, no, there was a reason you couldn't. There's no reason. Yeah, sure. Just haven't done it. You can add that list to your list of to-dos. Next, Frick. Uh, We're doing a lot of tours tonight. Am I forgetting anything? Anybody I should be giving a shout out to? John Beck is here. I'm not sure if he was in one of your classes. He was. Yeah, John Beck is here. John hey, was John. In the last one. Santa. Yeah. Santa Claus. Big John. John Vietnam vet. Also known as Santa Claus. Got a big beard. Well, one of the Santa Clauses. We have two. Yes. This is this would have been the uh, the Vietnam vet. Well, actually, you know what? That Santa Claus was a Vietnam vet as well. I haven't heard from Santa in a long time. If you're out there, big shout out. You and Mrs. Claus, thank you for the supporting us. Next, Frick. <coughs> um, Travis Dusenberry in Virginia Beach. I should, I should say a little more. Santa, Santa Claus really helped us get Purple Heart Project off and, off and ground. He was the first person I contacted after Jesse, Jesse um, Paratus. Um, Paratus reached out to me. I contacted Santa Claus and said, look, you know, we've helped a lot of people, but here's somebody that really needs it. And he just said, you get a hold of Jesse and tell him he's coming to Canada to spend a week with you. And, and uh, the rest is history. I haven't heard from him while. I hope, he's, I hope he's all right. I know he's had some health issues. Go ahead, Frick. Sorry. Okay. Uh, Travis Dusenberry in Virginia Beach. He says, Travis? I, yep. Dusenberry? Uh-huh. Hey, Travis. I built a route style. Jeff lives in Virginia Beach. Get together. Are you ready? Yep. I built a root style Who's work. Who's this question from? <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> I built a root style workbench and have a cheap cast iron vice that I use. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I didn't hear what you said. What style? Is it root or route? Route style workbench? Root style? Spell it. R-O-U-T-E. Uh, I don't know. That's a new one to he, me. He might have been, spe- been Rubo? saying Rubo and it autocorrected. Oh, uh, okay. And so we'll assume it's a Rubo style workbench and. Who is this? Jeff? <laughs> Travis. <laughs> Travis? Travis from Virginia Beach. <laughs> Are you done? Yep. Okay. He has a cheap cast iron vice that I use. As an end vice, I would really like to replace that vice with a wagon vice. Do you have any recommendations for a wagon vice that can be installed after the bench has been built? Well, um, unfortunately, no, but I know other people have have thought about that and done it. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know if there's anything commercially available that is designed to be added after the fact. If I had the problem and I was sitting there, I'm sure we could come up with an idea, but I, um, I don't know what your bench looks like, so that's kind of hard to do. But, uh, you know, if it was a solid slab, my bench up is a solid slab, I could certainly figure out a way to cut out that L shape and figure out a way to install this. This, this has to be able to slide on something. So I've got a groove on both sides. I've got a piece of two pieces of coca bolo that are squeezed in between this piece and the bottom piece, and the coca bolo because it's naturally oily, so it slides well in there. It's trapped between these two, so this is cut in half this way, and then when it's squeezed back together and it squeezes on those two pieces of coca bolo, they're what keeping this. They're they are what keeping they are. What keeps this bench dog moving on the same plane as the bench top? So I wouldn't think it'd be terribly hard to go in and figure out a way to throw that back on. You could always add, you could always add a piece to the outside, which would give you your other half of the support, another groove, and then you could do something back here as well. Even if it was just a matter of of taking a piece this wide and gluing it in place there, so with a hole through it, so you could mount your hardware to we sell this hardware but um, whether or not you could adapt it to what you're doing i don't know but worth a try next rick uh 
This is uh, another another question from Len. Len? Uh, yeah. Where's Len? I forget. I what was his it. first question? Is this is this okay? No, it's different. Oh, not different. One? He says I'm fairly tall. Six, Double dipping, Len. Six three. To increase the height of the now bench, you're showing off. is there anything to alter other than increasing the length of both the trestle long and short legs, and modifying the assembly mold to accommodate the increased length of the trestle legs? Okay, uh, and now that I know exactly what you're talking about, read that again, please. I figured. To increase the height of the bench, is there anything to alter other than increasing the length of both the trestle long and short legs? And this is who? Sharp. Len. Well, Len, I have a gentleman coming to the class in September who is a little over seven feet tall, and I need to make a bench for him. But I can't just take this bench and raise it up three feet. It would be too unstable. So I think we're going to go 24 inches wide. We'll probably make it a little longer. And, uh, of course, all the height is going to come in the leg. We're just going to raise that leg up instead of just adding pieces to the bottom. What you can do... Jake, are they close by? Who's they? The, uh, on the opposite side. The razor, the risers. On one of the carts. So what we do, because you never know who's coming to the class, and we get a lot of guys that are 6'3", 6'4", 6'5". I think we've had one 6'6". Six, six. We make these real simple. They're different heights. So this is just a block of wood, and it's got a piece on either side, and we lift that up. We slide this under, one on each end, and it gives you an extra two inches or three inches or four inches in height. And because it's got those side pieces on there, it's not tippy. And it's a really fast, easy way to elevate the workbench to accommodate somebody who's opposite of me. Next, Rick. Next one is from Michael. and Col- Here, show this off. So we're, we're training Bo. My uh, son number three, child number eight, Bo, just graduated from high school. Congratulations, Bo. And uh, at least for now, he wants to get into our business. He has been working here for the last several years, but his job has been packaging tools. Now he wants to be on the floor. So we're teaching him to turn. So I... I don't want him uh, practicing on the real thing, so I gave him a bunch of pine blocks, and I said, turn me. Practice turning all the shapes in order to make our marking gauge. I don't remember which one this is, but he's actually now actually doing them, and he does a great job. He's got, you got to get this, this rate. This has to have a nice flow, and this, you see, that's not quite what it should have been. That should be a half round, or a quarter round, sorry, but he's improved it. That just happened to be one of them. Another Cosman stepping up to the plate. Carry on the brand. Next, Frick. Michael in College Point. You remember the first time you (laughs) stepped up to the plate, Frick, and went to work on a hand plane? Scrub plane, I think it was. Could we bring that clip up? I've erased that from my memory. (laughs) Yes, you put the blade in backwards and made me make a fool of myself. Uh Uh-huh, so funny. (laughs) Can Can I ask this question now? Yeah, go ahead. Michael in College Point, New York. My local hardwood mill Michael. has laminated quarter sawn red oak in various widths and lengths, one and a half inch thick. I was thinking of taking three of them and gluing them together to make a four and a half top inch top for a workbench. Is this an okay idea? No. Okay. Uh, I was you were throwing words out there, and I was trying to envision what you're saying. So, <laughs> read again what he's got, what they have, what they offer. Uh, red cor- laminated quarter sawn red oak. Laminated quarter sawn red oak. So he wants to take three pieces that are one and a half inch thick to make a four and a half inch top. Wants to know if that's an okay idea. Well, no. Um, so the, here's the problem. Can I sit on this? First problem is it's made out of wood. We don't like wood. <laughs> Just kidding. Make it out of wood, it's going to move. So 
So that means you're going to have to periodically go in and resurface it. I've got a, this bench is waiting to be done. It's got a hollow in the middle. Didn't have it there when I built it. Where'd it come from? It came. It's probably not flat front to back end to end either. So there's a maintenance issue. Nice thing about MDF, that doesn't happen. Um, the other downside to oak, cortisone or not, is that oak is very porous. You can take a piece of red oak, and if you're a smoker, you can blow smoke all the way through the pores because it's very, very porous. So that gets really dirty, really dirty. And you may say, well, you may say, who cares? Well, you know what? It gets grungy. So oak would be a poor choice for a bench top. So can we say especially red oak? Yeah, especially red oak because red oak is probably the of all the domestic hardwoods. Red oak is probably the most porous. Uh, white is the reason why you can't make a boat out of red oak and they don't make barrels out of red oak white oak because those pores are filled but red oak they're wide open so just can't do it I wouldn't do it next Rick next one's from Evan in Fredericksburg Virginia wow an actual there is Fredericksburg. a Fredericksburg Super Dave always flies into Fredericksburg New Brunswick nobody knows where that is we have a Fredericton but we found a Fredericksburg in Virginia. And what's his first name? Evan. Evan, what's his question? I've been considering purchasing your wagon vice hardware for my first bench, bench build. Have you considered using a hand tool in, or a hand wheel instead of a traditional sliding wooden handle? No, no, I haven't. I don't. I just, uh, yeah, tr I'm stuck in tradition. Well, that... And think of where the wheel was. Well, and the other, the other problem, too, is you've you got to keep it below the surface. You don't want it to interrupt. You don't want to, yeah, Now, I, re, I realize that at this point, this is actually stepping up above, but if I had to, I could move it. it. You wouldn't have a very big hand wheel. You wouldn't be able to have a very big hand wheel and keep it below the surface. And the reason why you need a larger diameter hand wheel is for leverage. So the biggest reason is, no, I just like the, tra tra the traditional look of that styled handle so if you can get by the other issue then go go to it but i like this get it you'll love it we just got a shipment come in just came in a week ago mm -hmm. and uh paul hayden who is our partner in ontario and paul is a, a genius um i've worked with paul for now for probably oh my goodness i bet you it's coming up on 15 years and whenever I've had a whenever I've had a challenge to try to design something, I call Paul, and uh, Paul, I'm amazed at how he can just take my idea, and the next thing you know, he adds some practical things to it because Paul's all I I think of the idea, but Paul has the knowledge of okay now it's got to be manufactured, so widget A may be an incredible invention but impossible to manufacture. Um, uh, economically so Paul's always been able to add that and we've come up with Paul uh, helped us I give him most of the credit for our mortise engage he uh, he uh, the Sean Shim that Sean McDermott came up with the idea Paul turned it into a product um, our wood hinge our wood hinge drill jig that uh, was just a single one Paul's, it was Paul's idea to mix and match the pieces. So you buy a kit and you can make eight different configurations. Um, my dovetail trainer, which you put on the end of your saw to get you at the angles. I had the, con I had the idea. Paul turned it into a product. Adjuster. The adjuster. Paul manufactures our adjuster. We had, again, we had the idea. And Paul whipped his magic together and we came up with that for three different types of planes. And he just donated a thousand bucks. Paul did? He's such a good guy. I'll just keep talking to you, Paul. <laughs> talking about making another thousand. <laughs> and and these. Um, so this vice and now I a local guy um, helped with the original concept of these, and we got some of them off the ground. But then he uh, he wasn't interested in carrying on business. He was wanted to retire. So Paul picked up where we turned off there, and we had a few little things that we improved on that. What, anything else? What am I, for, what am I forgetting? Well, I'm sure if given time, I'd come up with some more things that he's done. 
So he's been a what huge chunk part of our business. What was the question that led to that? Yeah, what was the question? Oh, the, no, the uh, spin wheel, right. or the, the round wheel instead of the handle. Next one, Frick. Uh, Rick Simonol Simononi. Rick. Yep. In Where's San Rick? San Diego, California. San Diego. He says I played. No, what were you born? Were you married in San Diego, Frick? I was. First time. Yep. <laughs> he says I plan to build the new bench. I want to. I want to use a wagon wheel and vice. I am left-handed. If I use a right-hand setup, do you see a problem? It would mean that I. It would mean that I would be planing into the vice instead of away from the vice. So why do you need to use, why can't you just put this on the other end and make it a left-handed bench, Rick? What? Sorry, we're not paying attention. I mean, it's Rick. Were you, you being me? <laughs> it's Rick. Did Rick I say it, Rick? Rick? Yeah, I think well, Yeah, I, I thought said you said, yeah, we're asking me no. the question. Well, uh, no, you don't want to plane into, well, I suppose you could. But just do your bench, just reverse everything. I made just one for Ivar. I've made this very bench for a left-handed guy. His name is Ivar Nielsen up in Ontario. And uh, we just turned everything around, but it didn't need different hardware. So you can, you can make it a left-handed bench real easy. Just flip it over. Well, a little more than that. Next, Rick. Any more vets on? Nope. Well, if they are, they haven't. Remember, if you have been to one of our classes, Combat Wounded Vet, at Frick and your name and when you were there and we'll give you a shout out love to go ahead Frick uh, okay Todd Michael in Leakesdale Ontario hi Todd okay this is a long one so pay attention a lot of Ontario pay attention a lot of Ontario guys tonight. Frick, Frick doesn't want to repeat himself no this is a long don't one don't chew your cabbage twice Frick I've seen you mention in your videos what is required to resurface or flatten a workbench top, which seems like a big job. It is. Do you see anything wrong with first mounting glide rails on both sides of the top and using a sled and router to flatten the top, much like it's done, much like is done to big natural edge slab tabletops? No, the you could do that. You could do that. Um. You could do that, or you could just take the time to get really good with your hand plane. Now, in the end, you'd have to be planed anyway. Well, yeah, you're going to have to. I don't want to sand my top. I want to come right off the hand plane. He, sa he said that before you interrupted me. What? He said, then I would just have to do the final surfacing with a hand plane before yeah. applying a new coat of finish. I would just do it with a plane, and it'll be a, it'll be a good lesson, and uh, it'll skill that will just serve you well. For your woodworking days. So no, you could do either or. Either or. I'll do mine. I'll do mine the traditional way, and it'll be a lot of work, but it'll get done. Next, Rick. I don't uh, like routers. How many do I own? Eighteen, nineteen. At least. I like what they do. I don't like using them. They're loud. I, I damage my hearing on one side because of an old Sears Craftsman router I had. I remember the incident. They vibrate. They're dangerous. Messy. They're messy, yes. We're using them here today and dust everywhere. And uh, they just, uh, one slip and they're, they can end a project. But they're a necessary evil. So no, if I can avoid using them, I do. Next, Rick. Uh, can you talk about the moxin vice? I got plantar fasciitis in this foot. So the that wasn't my I'm question. Sitting down. What? That wasn't my question. No, I just want to tell them. They don't, I don't. It's the first He's time I've ever. Snippy. Sat. What? He's getting <laughs> snippy over there. Everyone is commending me on my patience with you. Just so you know. First time you'll ever be commended for your patience. Yeah, that's true. You're the only. Re you're just being selective keep in what you read. <laughs> what was that? Moose said, "Keep it up, and you're going to be a patient." <laughs> we'll put another chisel over there near your bench. Nope. Okay, so what was your question? Uh, talk about the mox advice. Oh. What about it? I don't know. Talk about it. Oh, is that what he just says? Talk about it? That's a Luther thing. Oh, that's Luther. Well, that's actually a good idea, Luther. So, uh, do you remember the guy's name? No. Jack Lane alerted me 
to either an article or somebody in his woodworking club. I apologize. Maybe Luther will come up with his name. He deserves it because it was a great idea. And what Jason? he did. Jason he, Langle. Jason Langle? Something yes, like that, that sounds right. Did you remember that? Yeah. Young fellow with a good no, name. No, I, I looked it up in the last. Moose Holden. So. Jason didn't have a workbench, wanted to learn to cut dovetails, the Rob Cosman way. Needed a vice. Drop your blade. Needed a vice. Um, was looking around his shop thinking, what am I going to do for a vice? Now, if you're going to cut dovetails, you want to have something solid and secure. You don't want it rocking around. And he saw, he says, well, the table saw. Is the, most, is the heaviest, most stable piece of equipment in here. And this end of the table saw is essentially unused. Mine is a saw stop, and there's three. I think there's four. Four? There's sure. four holes that are already bored through the edge. And it's cast iron, so it's easy to bore. So what he did is he put a piece of maple on here. And then he bored holes through, put the rods in, holes drilled through this. So there's a nut here and there's a nut back here that holds that piece secure. So now you've got these two bolts sticking out. The hand wheels go on from the outside. There's a washer in here to cut the friction. That actually could be greased. Um, wasn't Luther's idea? No. Whose idea was it? David Barron. David Barron over in England had the idea to add a spring in here. So the hole that we bored in this piece, doesn't come all the way through, was enough to capture this nut and include the spring. So as you wind this in, those holes suck up the nut and it'll allow you to close this down tight against your workpiece. Um, the fact that the springs are there, when you wind this open, Instead of having to pull this with a third hand, the springs bring it back. So these are made by Woodcraft, and they have a little flat spot on there. So we had wonderful Willie drill and tap them. Jake accessed these little knobs, and it just makes it a whole lot easier to operate by doing that. We never use it, but it's so cool I left it on there. Now, this piece is beveled back so that you can get in a little bit closer with your saw, particularly if you're doing something like cutting half blinds where you want to be able to, draw, your saw needs to go on an angle. What about adding this to Cosmo? So, Western? what we're thinking of doing, we're going to do a YouTube video where you build a uh, detachable Moxon vise that you would clamp on top of, at the edge and on top of your Cosmo workbench, what that does is it elevates your work. You want your bench to be low enough that you can conveniently and easily plane with it. And it's nice when you're using your plane, it's nice to be able to be on top of it as opposed to just behind it. So a low enough height that you can put a little bit of your upper body weight down on top of the plane. However, in order to have a bench low enough for that, it means when you're cutting dovetails, and you don't want your workpiece right up here because it vibrates too much. You want it down relatively close to the bench. I'm going to use my little three-quarter saw. But it means that you're bending over quite a bit. So by having the Moxon vise, it would move on this bench. It would move my sawing point from here probably up to here. And for folks that have bad backs or they're a little bit older or they just want that convenience, you simply would bring your Moxon vise up. You'd clamp it on either side, and it gives you a nice rock solid. We've got to get that done. We'll try to do that this week. That was a good, good call, Luthie. So what we now, uh, we, uh, you know, people sometimes accuse me of being a salesman. Well, pfft, I don't care. Remember this. Nobody works till the salesman does his job. I sell what I use, and I use what I sell. So if you look around here in the shop, anything that I use is something that we offer for sale. And why did that happen? Well, I started, I started uh, my selling career representing Lee Nelson 
and I used to do demonstrations from coast to coast across Canada. And I had often, a lot of my tools had me either, I'd either made or modified. And I'm sitting there doing a demonstration, and the guy says, I want to be able to cut dovetails just like you. Where do I get that saw you're using? I said, well, I made it. He said, well, I want it. And I can't have it. It's mine. So we started making saws that same style. And it, uh, everything in here that you see, there's some, some small modification that I've done to it. So we make those available. So if you want to be able to do dovetails the same way as I do, there's no reason why you can't because all the tools that I use, we offer for sale. That's my story, and I'm sticking with it. Next one, Fred. This one comes from Stephen Sun in the chat. Oh, wait a minute. Let me just finish that one. So the Mox and Vice, which I think is a really cool idea, we now, we now uh, cosmonized the uh, Wood River kit. We added the knobs to it, included the springs. Anything else? Well, drill and tap. And, and drill and tap. So when you buy it now, it's all ready for you to have just like that. Sorry, Frick. Go again. Exercise more patience. This is from Steven in the chat. Hi, Steven. If I use MDF for the top, what would you do to take out any accidental marks on it? Oh, we covered it. Yeah. yeah. If you go back a little bit, I'll show you how I actually demonstrated using cyanacrylate to repair it. And then you can just uh, smooth it off with... Uh, I actually... I, what I didn't show you was that. So here's how I would... Where is it, Jake? Cyanacrylate or... My blade. Oh, it's right here by the router. Here it is. So I keep this plain blade. It's never uh, had a back bevel put on it. And after, if I've gone in and repaired something, I would then come in with my plane, and I would just flush it up. It didn't take much. Down on the edge. And then along like this. Ooh, bad idea. I don't know why is there a bump there? Oh, that's why. So I'm keeping that, I'm referencing that on the back part. That needs another little spot of glue. That's the easiest way to repair it. And we've got benches out there that after every, after every class, you know, some guy has gone in and he's, he's cut into the bench with the end of his saw. But we just go in and make the repairs and it lasts a long time. If you take care of it. And, I'm, and I've got strangers, well, not strangers, but I've got uh, visitors using my benches, so you're doing it yourself. You're not going to cut into Frick, it too Frick. many times. Next, Frick. Next one's from Red Cat. Switch Mac. Red Cat in the chat. Red Cat Maximus. Frick, switch Mac. Why? It's dying. Which one? The other one. Red Cat Maximus? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, mo it's about the Mox and Vice. How would you attach it securely to your bench top? Well, you're going to have to wait and see the video we're going to do, but uh, you just uh, provide, you make some kind of a platform on the bottom that sticks out beyond the edges of the Moxon vise that you can clamp it. So, on, on, which is going to be designed for this one, you would clamp it here and here. Your Moxon vise is in the middle. It'll be, it'll be quite simple, but we'll, uh, we'll make it and then uh, you'll know exactly how to do it. Next, Rick. We need, where, where, where are we going to do that? We're going to have some of those, right, for the class. Because we get guys in every class that uh, either back injuries or something, it would be a big advantage for them to be able to hold that up high. Next, Rick. Uh, this one comes from Drew Ferguson. Hold that thought for just a second. The other nice thing about that additional mox and vice is if you had a project where you were building a chest of drawers and let's say the side was 22 inches wide, even on that style vise, if I was cutting dovetails and something 22 inches wide, the best I could do here is clamp five and a half inches of it. So I've got that much unsupported. That's not going to work. If I was using, if I was uh, using this, my, I've got, Six, I've got eight inches unsupported. Now, I could clamp it against this. But if you make one of these portable Moxon vices, you could make it as wide as you need it because there is no, there are no limiting factors. 
Well, except for the wheel. I've got 19 inches, 19 and a half inches in between, but I could have made that as long as I, as I wanted. Of course, the longer you make it, the stiffer these pieces are going to need to be in order to apply sufficient pressure in the middle. You could actually even put a little bit of a bow in it intentionally just so that it did apply pressure, but most people put way too much pressure, more than they need. Next, Ferg, sorry. Uh, Kevin Ferg, or Drew Ferguson. Hey, Drew. Where's he from? Uh, the chat. I don't know. The chat. He'll, let, he'll let us know. I have two sheets of one inch MDF to make a bench top. What are the advantages or disadvantages of making the top four inches thick? Will the Schoberg vise handle a chop or jaw that is four inch thick? Uh, you know, the only problem you're going to encounter, number one, it doesn't need to, be, there's no real, you're not, that's the law of diminution return kicks in. You're adding another inch into there, you're really not gaining anything. You're not gaining anything, any appreciable amount. But your, all the, your jaw or your vice is pulling from the underside. So the farther away you are, the more you're wanting to pull down on the inside. Um, yeah, it's probably well, there's not. No, a, there's no gain, and there might be diminishing. Yeah. It's, I mean, nah. I wouldn't do it. I don't, I don't think you're going to ever. Not for the, not for you're the gonna, I don't think you're, you're ever going to say to yourself, wow, I wish I'd have made it an extra inch thick because I don't think it would be an issue. Next, Rick. Uh, Rob Teal, also in the chat. Rod or Rob? Rob. R-O-B. B, Rob, Is yeah. Bravo? Yes. Hey, Rob. Do you recommend CA in the dog holes? Yes. Yeah, I would use, I would use CA before I would use anything else. It's a little bit expensive, but and it runs all over the place, and the next thing you know, you got it running on your hand, you didn't even realize it, and you're stuck to the bottom side of your bench. So I, I, I wish there was some way that I could figure out. You can't really put it on a, uh, on a brush because it'll harden, but it would, be, it would be nice to be able to go in. I wonder if we could spray it. Probably not. It would gunk up. Yeah. You almost need to be, if you put the bench on its side, if you put the bench on its side, you could then get it front to back, you know, like this. I could go in right now, and I could... I could run cyanacrylate in there fairly easily on all of those, and then I could turn this up on its end, and I could do the other quarter, and then turn, turn it on the other side, and it do the, yeah, that's the way you could do it. It would be time-consuming, and like I said, it uses up a lot of material, but, you know, if you went through a couple of bottles, big deal. Next, Rick? I'm out. You're out? Yeah. No more questions? Well, Luther's been answering most of them in the chat. And I'm out from the newsletter. Yeah. How many uh, How many people on? 634. Well, that's better. 2,600 in donation. 2,600 in donation. So if we hit 3,000, we can give away three prizes. Just saying. Um, what else can I tell you? Question, Rob. Yeah. In raising the bench, would you ever consider a platform? A platform? Well, raising the floor. Right? Oh, you mean so somebody, if, if somebody's short? Did you see those things that we had out there for, for, for raising the bench? But you're talking about raising it a platform so somebody that's short. No, it's, well, it's put it. You could put a platform for the, to stand on, or you could. Put a platform for the bench to stand on. So we have these things. I'll grab it. What did I. Oh, it is right here. It was right there in front of the bench. Yeah. We put one under each under each foot. Yeah, no, I was thinking like almost building a, a fault. A sub floor. Well, the only problem is, then where would you stand? Well, it would just be the. You're trying to raise the bench for a tall person. Right? Yeah. You're, he's saying just the put the the footprint of the bench would go on a a platform. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's the, the nice thing about those because they've got those high sides. It's not a stability issue. Yeah. But the other thing is we're sitting on a concrete floor. And it's, it's nice to be able to move things around. seems like every time we do this, these guys always like to move their bench just a little bit to whether it's to avoid somebody on the other side or what. Right. We've yet to find the perfect layout, but there may not be one. We just did. 
Why? Uh, Jake, can you, oh, Jake right. can you point the camera at the underside of Rob's bench top? Oh, I this one? going to say underside of Rob's. <laughs> what do you want to say? Of this? I think so, yeah. What are they looking for? I don't know. You're not going to be able to do it with that monstrous <laughs> thing. Can you turn it sideways or the okay. camera will be sideways? What do they want to see, Chris? I don't know. Yeah, get over here. Well, let, let me, me see if I can tell you what's section. under here. Let me get under the main section. So, there is, the, because this is four inches, you have to have a filler piece so that the bench sits level. So, there's a filler piece right in here that goes all the way over. And then this is also the supports the tool tray. Yeah, this is the bottom of the tool tray. So it sits underneath the bottom of the tool tray. Um, why is this piece here supporting the tool tray? The center of it. Oh right, yeah, because the tool tray has two two bottoms in it. I didn't. I don't know why I did that, but I did. That supports that. All of these pieces are designed to allow for seasonal movement. So it's made fast and glued right here. All the movement goes that way. So these screws are sitting on double washers in, an oblo in a larger diameter hole that allows for seasonal movement without any problems. And I actually have, I have two bolts on there for some reason. Oh, but I have, I have it in a longer hole. Same idea, allows things to move. You could show them your uh, sharpening station, the way it's held. Uh, well, that's... No, well, that, that, that's a little bit different than the Cosman bench. So my sharpening station has has uh, sharpening stations out here. So there's a bolt that goes all the way through. There's a little rabbit cut on the end of this piece of mahogany that slides in here, and it squeezes between the two, so I can change the height, move it up and down if I want Which is to. good for the amount of times you've moved it. Yes, yes, all of once, I think. You want to show them that little improvement you you're coming up with? Or are you ready for it yet? I got a question mm -hmm. on the uh, sliding on the tray, on the tool tray for the ba for the stones. Mm, not yet. Not yet. What frick? Uh, Mike D in the chat says, "Would a two-inch MDF top with a three-quarter inch hard maple top layer be better for durability with less concern for wood movement?" Ooh. No. What? Two it? inches of MDF with a piece of plywood on top. Two inches of MDF with a three-quarter inch hard maple top layer. Hard maple top. Oh well, then you, you've got uh, you've got maple that a, a solid wood top that moves on a piece of MDF that doesn't move. So that wouldn't. Uh, I mean, you could do it, but you'd have to allow for the movement, and I don't think you're gaining anything. Try to really keep it simple. If you're, if, so, move my glasses. If your bench is something that you want to show off your craftsmanship and use, then take the time to build a bench like this or whatever you want. If your bench is being built merely as a place where you can work, it gives you a nice, flat, stable work surface then this is your best option, I think. If you want to build this bench, you need a bench. So you build this bench first, relatively inexpensive, and you use it to construct this one. If you're trying to build a bench like this and you don't have a good bench to work on, good luck. You're going to need it. So all roads bring you back to the Cosman workbench, and then you can take it from there. And that can become your assembly bench if after working on it and building this, what am I going to do with it? Well, that's what you use to build things on. Give you a quick example since we've got just a couple minutes. If I was building a chest of drawers, and there's one sitting out there, you'll see it. It has six drawers in it. So that means there's six dividers. So six dividers that have to be glued in to the sides. Well, trying to do it upright and hold those clamps all in position, crazy. Instead, you lay one of the sides of the drawers down here. Now here's your dados. You put your divider in. You clamp it here under, from underneath here. So in other words, this becomes a big call, C-A-U-L. You clamp top to underneath on both sides. 
you get your square in there and you square it up. And because this is nice and solid and the, the, big, the big divider, if it's made out of solid wood or if it's made out of plywood, is not going to need to be clamped in the middle. It'll be sufficient to be clamped on the two edges. Let me just uh, grab a piece of something so I can better explain this. So the side of my case is laying flat on my nice flat bench top. Here's my divider. It goes into the dado and I clamp from underneath here to up here on both sides. I square it up. When the glue's dry, I move on to the next one and I do each one until it's all done. Then as a last piece, I add the top to that. Now that's a little bit tricky because you gotta put four, you've gotta glue and put four dividers into the grooves all at the same time. But at least your clamps aren't having to be held in midair because gravity holds them in place. That's where you wanna glue with a good open time. And you would just hang each of those clamps now in this case, the top needs to have a pressure applied in the middle. So you make a call, piece of two by four, and you put a curve on it, so that, and the curve is going to be facing down. So when you clamp it on both edges, because of the curve in the board, by the time you pull those outside edges down flat against the side of your case, the curvature of the wood is putting a lot of pressure in the middle and that'll pull everything together just honky-dory. So this becomes a great assembly bench. Frick, no. Frick, any more vets to say hello to? Uh, shoot, I did have one. Who? Tell us. Well, I can't find it now. How much are we giving away tonight? Two. We didn't go over three thousand. Is Megan? Oh, Megan and uh, Megan and Megan and Moosey on. Doubt it. Ah. So Jake's wife Megan and his little boy Moose, little boy Moose, <laughs> left yesterday for a nightmare trip home. Do not fly, right now. Theirs was a nightmare from the word go. They finally made it home. They were home for the whole month of July, so we don't get to see little Moosey. Jake will be missing his boy. But if they're on, big howdy. Why did I bring that up? What was I going to say? I don't remember. All right, what are we giving away, Frick? Let's give away three dead cats. We ready? Yeah, are we at two, Jake? We didn't go over the three? Just zoom in on him, Jake, so it's... Zoom in on what? On you, because it's too far. I have you shrunken in there. Okay, that's good. All right. First dead cat. Oh, chances of winning tonight are 1 in 389. I thought you said we had 600 people on. Yeah, I know. But only half of them registered for the... Wow. That's correct. First dead cat is going to... Does she put that on the custom clip declaration? Rob has One dead cat. In Michigan. Rob in Michigan. Um, July, August, September... Three months' time, brother. You're going to thank me for this. Congratulations. Okay, next one. Think of moose when you're getting warm and toasty. Next one's going to Ken Miller in Calgary. Ken in Calgary. You'll need it. You'll, you'll need it 11 of the 12 months of the year. Dead cat on its way. And the third dead cat is going to... I soon we'll have three daughters living in Calgary. Kenzie's on her way. Or actually, she shipped her horses today. Victor Gonzalez in Mexico. Victor in Mexico. Well, if he has a high altitude where he lives, he might. Uh, now, Victor, you also have the option of a, uh, a, a, a blue golf sweater with, shirt with the uh, Dead Cat logo on there as well. You let us know Purple which heart one you logo. want. Huh? Purple Heart logo. What did I say? Dead Cat logo. <laughs> The Purple Heart logo. Dead Cat logo. All right, what are we giving away now? Um, let's give away one of Kev's plaques first, and then we'll give away, I'm going to decide what we're going to give away of Jeff's. So, um, granite or, 
or slate. I really like the slate. Your choice. And Kevin will personalize it for you with whatever flag you want in the backdrop. And he'll ship it to you. And it's going to Chuck Edwards in Florida. Hey, Chuck, in Florida. Congratulations. Kevin will be in touch. You get on. You get in touch with us first so we can make you put in contact with Kevin. Yeah, the email address is down in the corner for those of you who have won. Make sure you email that. That's Gina. And let's give away a uh, one of Jeff's shave brushes and bowl sets with the soap. I forgot to mention Jesse Rufian's too. Jesse, these are Jeff, Jesse's. Uh, oh, that's who's here. Sorry. Oh, Jesse's on? Yes. Hey, Jess. And, uh, How are you, brother? Shoot, he wanted us to give a shout out to his family who's with him. Just give me a second. Oh, the the uh, the the fam jam, fam, r- r- what's he call them? Wyatt. The, what? What's he say? Yeah, the fam jam. The uh, fam jam. Wyatt and Grace. If you can give a shout out to them. Hey, Wyatt and Grace, your dad is a really good woodworker. Probably the best that I've had here. He's awesome, and I'm not saying that just because I like him. He's good. In fact, he's so good. He actually works for us, does some work for us. Excellent woodworker. All right. And a real good guy, too. Shave ball's going to CJ Tashoff in Virginia. CJ in Virginia. Oh, that's near Jeff. That's great. Congratulations. So when are we back, Frick? Uh, It'd have to be at least three weeks from today. So it's going to be the Saturday just before the class. Yeah. So our next broadcast will be on the 23rd of July, I think, if that's a Saturday. And we'll do an hour, and then we'll do the second hour on the Thursday night in the middle of the class. And that's where we get to walk around and talk to all the guys, give you a little sample of what your uh, generous funds have gone towards. You get to meet some of these guys, and it's awesome. Everybody, Every time we've done it, people have said, this is great. So we will do it again. We'll keep that up, make that a tradition. Uh, big thank you for all those who have supported us. Great to have you on here. We try to do our best to give you good information and help you in your woodworking. Share it. If you know any combat wounded veterans, whether it's a mental wound or a physical wound, that you think would benefit from our program, we are still taking applications. Um, unfortunately, there are some stipulations in order to get into Canada. Uh, one is that you have to have been vaccinated. So we've had a lot of guys that have been accepted in the program but can't get in. So as a result of that, we are accepting applications still for this year. So we have uh, a class coming in July. Now, that one's full. We have an August class, a September class, an October class. So you're still welcome to, uh, welcome to apply. A big shout out to Super Dave, who takes care of three classes, and Luther takes care of the other three classes. So with that kind of help, it uh, makes the program work flawlessly. So you guys have a, an enjoyable, a happy 4th of July to all our Americans. Happy Canada Day to those of us north of the border, although it was yesterday, it's a Canada Day weekend. And we will see you in a couple of weeks' time. Take care.